Well, good morning. Welcome to City Hall. Uh, we'll get started this morning with um, the uh, uh, prayer from Dr. Tom Ogren from the First Baptist Church of Oklahoma City. And after that, I'll ask uh, Councilwoman Meg Salyer to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody rise, please. I stood here first eight years ago, one week into my pastorate at First Baptist Church. The church, like the city, had gone through a long, dark night, but the, the church, like the city, has gone through a season of renewal and renaissance. We're now, now a vital part of this community and a part of the work of this city, providing the spiritual home for, for five refugee congregations, providing an English as a second language laboratories, being a critical partner in the renewal of the Class and Tenpin community. And on each of your spots is a brochure for Good Shepherd Ministries, which your colleague David Greenwell serves as a board member. That is a ministry born out of First Baptist Church and continues to be a part of, a vital part of who we are, providing medical, dental, food and clothing for our community. Recently receiving a $7.7 .7 million grant from the Butterfield Foundation to expand medical care in our community. We're grateful for you, we're grateful for our city, we're grateful to be a part of it. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for our great city, a place of promise and of hope, a place of grand dreams and aspirations. And I pray for these city leaders, Lord, who provide wisdom and guidance and direction for who we are and who we are becoming. Lord, I pray for them that you will provide encouragement and strength for them as they struggle with making the right decision, not the easy decision, not the good decision, but the best decision and the right decision. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them in what they do and bless our city through them. We offer this day their actions, our city before you, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Your Honor, uh, before we get started, may I call Dr. Ogburn back up here and just visit with him for a moment or two? Uh, I think since we do address the issue of, of trying to assist our citizens, especially in the area of providing health care and also uh, the food pantry through Good Shepherd Ministry, it, it would really be uh, worth our time just to visit a little bit further about that. and. Tom, last night, there's even discussions about the uh, possibility of taking some of those efforts into outlying areas with respect to providing food and, and more nutritional type of meals to areas within our city that don't have uh, a full service grocery store, for example. So not only do you just serve that local community, you're really expanding throughout the city. Well, part of our reality is there are parts of our cities like Midtown Bricktown and other out areas that have had tremendous growth in our places of grand opportunity. But there are still many of our citizens, too many of our citizens, who live lives where hope and desperation define their day rather than opportunity and dream. Where hunger is part of their reality, where lack of medical care is part of how they deal with everyday life. So part of what we've tried to do through First Baptist Church is step into those moments. For those who've come from countries where conflict, war, and disaster have been a commonplace scene, we've tried to become the spiritual and emotional home for those to provide them a place of promise. For our citizens who live on the other side of the economic divide, trying to provide ministries of dignity that despite the best efforts of government, the need for medical care in our city is profound. There are still too many who do not have access to critical medical care because of insurance. And their answer has been to go to the emergency rooms where they stand in long lines for what really needs to be cared for, for by a primary doctor. So part of our joy is through the Butterfield Grant, which is, if you don't know the Butterfield Foundation, it was created when Deaconess Hospital was sold to a for-profit organization. Free Methodist made the choice to take the proceeds and build the foundation to continue to further medical work in our city in a Christian context. That was a profound gift. The Free Methodists could have chosen to relocate it to another city or another state where they're more prevalent. But they chose to leave it here, and because of that, Good Shepherd and two other clinics have received substantive grants that will, in our case, allow us to operate 40 hours a week, becoming the medical home to many in our community who would otherwise have no medical home. We are investigating some very interesting options. 
in a partnership with Butterfield and others, we're looking at a mobile medical clinic that will literally not only say, come to our clinic, but letting, letting us put the clinic in critical neighborhoods in our city where people still live far from medicine. That's hard to imagine in our current culture, but there's still so many who, for simple things like prenatal care and inoculations and basic, basic physicals are not a part of their story. We wanna provide it not only on our campus, but in the middle of community. We're looking at our own site, we provide a large scale food pantry in cooperation with the regional food bank. But David is right, last night we're exploring a new partnership that would let us provide, if you can imagine, a portable grocery store providing healthy foods in neighborhoods where there's little or no access to grocery, grocery stores. There are whole zip codes in our city with, those, with no grocery stores. And many who cannot afford the prices they see in those grocery stores. So how do you make sure we move from potatoes and rice on the table to things that are sustainable for our children? So one of our goals is to begin to say, how do we provide good, healthy food at a price people can, can pay in a place that they can get to? We're excited to be part of the story. We're excited what you're doing in the city, but we feel like our church still has a vital responsibility. We've reached an era where people are beginning to wonder what is the value of the church and even wondering, okay, we've, we've said churches have been a tax neutral or tax free component. I will tell you that in my eight years, we have provided millions of dollars of ministries of resources for our city that otherwise would have had been, had been paid for. So we're a downtown church committed to stay downtown to shape what's going on in the life of the city, not only for those who are experiencing the joy of the Renaissance, but for those who've been left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I can make a comment, please. I think this demonstrates the great value face-to-face -face op operations bring to the city. They can do this in a much more efficient way than the city ever could. And I really appreciate their efforts in this area, and I think we should do all we can to support their efforts, but we need to realize that these people can answer these needs, social needs, much better than we can. Thank you. I'll call the meeting to order and uh, move on to item three, which is uh, from the office of the mayor. We have a, con a resolution for teacher of the month. Every, uh, every month, the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City helps us honor one of our fine teachers. And um, I'll ask Ms. Lang to come up here and join me, please. And I'll ask the clerk to read the mm -hmm. resolution. Pres, Joanne Lang has been named teacher of the month for March 2013 by the Edmond Public Schools Foundation and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Joanne is a third grade teacher at Charles Haskell Elementary School, has been making a difference in the lives of students for more than 23 years. Whereas Joanne Lang's colleagues all agree she is one of those people for which teaching is truly a passion and a calling. Whereas Joanne Lang has spent her teaching career committed to meeting the individual, academic, social, and emotional needs of every child she encounters. Whereas her dedication to her students goes above and beyond as she spends numerous hours outside of the school day and on weekends, ensuring that lessons are well planned and meet the diverse learning student needs of her students. Whereas Joanne Lang greets bus students each morning with a smile, setting the tone for having a great day. And at the end of the school day, she helps them get safely back to their buses for the trip home. They leave knowing that she genuinely cares and looks forward to seeing them again. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Joanne Lang on her selection as March 2013 Teacher of the Month by the Edmond Public Schools Foundation and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Yeah, we have a motion and a second. Now comes the critical part, and it passes unanimously. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. I truly feel honored. I mean, this is something that I thoroughly enjoy. I've been doing it for 25 years, and every day is a brand new day. And thank you. Thank you for recognizing something that I love to do. Well, thank you. She told me 25 years at the same school. And uh, was it all third grade? Actually, I started, uh, did a half a year in fifth, did um, Shannon Miller, at Shannon Miller. And then I moved to fourth and taught several years. Well, uh, it's well deserved, I'm sure. So, and I'm sure the children that you've uh, that you've touched over all those years certainly appreciate it too. I want them to know I care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate yes. it. Give her another hand, please. 
Mr. Mayor, I was gonna say one of the things that's so nice about this selection this year is it shows that we're, this month, is that we're recognizing not just the teachers in the I-89 district, um, which one might suspect, but we're recognizing all of the school districts that make up part of Oklahoma City. So it's lovely to see here today and congratulations on this nice recognition. Okay, we'll move on to item four, which is the Journal of Council Proceedings, receiving the proceedings for March 5th and approving the proceedings for February 26th. We have a motion and a second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, this morning, uh, a couple on page 14 under dilapidated items 8E1, uh, item D, 534 Southwest 10th Street, we ask that that be stricken to rework as property maintenance. And item H, 3217 Southwest 62nd Street, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has repaired. Moving on to item 8F1, item H, 2605 Southwest 62nd Street, we ask that that be stricken, that is now occupied. And then moving to page 16, uh, claims for denial. The municipal, municipal counselor's office is asked that two be stricken. The first is item 8M1A, the claim of Arvella Brown. And the next one is item 8M1B, the claim of uh, Christy Eisel. And we ask that that be stricken too. And those will both be brought back when additional information is received. Okay, do we have any other requests for uncontested continuances? I'll recess the council meeting and convene as Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Number of items. We have a motion and a second. Your Honor, I have a question. On these resolutions, it, it uh, directs the uh, city attorney not to appeal. Have we ever appealed one of these? And to whom would we appeal? Would it be another court? Uh, I'm sure we have appealed one at some point in the past. Not in my memory, but <laughs> that you would appeal. You, you appeal these to the uh, Supreme Court. We go to the Supreme Court. Right. Thank you. But we don't do it very often, so it's not important that we don't wear the Supreme Court. Is. Right. <laughs> Any other comments? Cast your vote. And it passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Number of items. Any comments or questions? I did just have a quick question to the manager. Um, Jim, I don't think I've seen before um, a resolution uh, um, allowing us to negotiate initially with one firm and secondarily with another if that didn't work out. Is that unusual? I just, I don't recall. No, we, we do th that is not unusual. We do that from time to time depending upon uh, what the item is. And uh, so we, it's not always commonplace, but, but it's, we've done it before. This is one where they went through and, and uh, they have, there was a very uh, distinct order and so we want to cover our base so in case of negotiations failed or we weren't able to do that. We, we were already lined we, up we, to. We, we could go right and. Okay. And, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA and convene as Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Two items. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Your Honor, I'd just like to point out that we're asking for natural gas powered chassis in this particular deal, which I think is important in, in the city's uh, ability to assume a leadership role. And I think this very important issue of trying to get as much of our transportation uh, powered by compressed natural gas as we possibly can. Thank you. Those have actually worked out very good for us, Mr. Ryan, for a number of reasons. One, because of the volume of natural gas that's used with those vehicles. It really does have significant fuel savings. Secondly, uh, because of, of they're in the neighborhoods and the trucks are much more quiet and they're much more less noxious. They, 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 the natural gas is much uh, I understand that the maintenance is a, it's a little better on those. It's we're still, we're still, it isn't more, but we, I don't think we've got that totally quantified yet. We'll thank, work thank. on that. Okay, we'll adjourn OCAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket.
Okay. Do we have any individual consideration? Just like to point out item AC uh, as well as AB. Six uh, I. And Mayor, if I could, I'd like to just mention six double A with a comment. David, won't you go ahead? Okay, well, first of all, on item AC, just wanted to recognize and, and thank uh, Bayettes uh, and Oklahoma City Beautiful for their donation to the uh, Merrill Medley Park, uh, a bench that will uh, go along with some of the artwork that's been donated down there. And uh, Lisa Sinar is here from Oklahoma City Beautiful. I wanted to thank them. and. Uh, mention that um, on item a B relocating some two firehouses on park property I think that's a great idea I know the area better around the Woodson Park area and the current location of that fire station is kind of in a declining area and to move it further east I think really makes a lot of sense uh, so I think that's a great idea just wanted to point that out and then finally, the uh, Capitol Hill Library. Uh, we're uh, looking at uh, negotiating a contract for uh, improvements to the library with an estimated cost of up to $3 million, which I think will be a great addition to that uh, part of the city. And just wanted to bring that out. And uh, hopefully they're working as far as obtaining the additional space that may be needed because that's an old concrete concrete bunker style of uh, building. You just don't make improvements to that kind of structure very easily. So I'm sure they've got it figured out. I'm not sure we've got it figured out. But oh, that, okay. That, and that project is obviously very, very near to Mr. White too on Capitol Hill. You know, uh, not to get in the middle of, of planning, but I just, have to ask the question, would it make better sense to possibly even relocate that library along, say, 25th Street to one of the existing uh, buildings that occupy uh, 25th Street instead of its current location on 26th Street? Just a question. It doesn't need to be answered. But uh, well, I think I can answer it for you. That'd probably be nice, but I don't think we have the funds at hand to do that. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, Meg? 6AA is just a um, housekeeping detail, really. I, um, this, the item is the uh, management letter for the Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, and I was uh, carefully reading it and hoping that David Greenwell would um, be able to explain some of the footnotes to me. It's, it's extremely complicated. Um, but Ann Simank is still listed as a trustee, and um, it's been a long time since she served as one of those. So I said, we're probably saving money on the letterhead, but. Perhaps we might want to revisit that. <laughs> I'm sure happy we'll to do that. Thank you. Anything else on the consent docket? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. At this point, I'd like to move up item 8H. I know we have a number of people in the audience. This is a resolution approving the request by Oklahoma City Beautiful to name the trails at Lake Hefner the Burt Cooper Trail in honor of the former Lake Herbert Trails Incorporated and Oklahoma City View Board Member Bert Cooper. And uh, is there somebody that would like to say a few words about that? Surely somebody would. Bert was such a, a, a huge part of this city. You, you couldn't hardly meet him at any of the activities that was going on and not realize how much uh, passion Bert had for anything he delved into. So this, um, this is an honor well deserved. And when the trails were built, he was a champion for the trails. And there was uh, not uh, total acceptance of the idea of trails around there. And uh, Bert persevered, and we've got probably one of the most, most outstanding walking trails in the country around Lake Hefner, I mean, Lake Galley. Bert had a way of not giving up on things. <laughs> <laughs> Your name and address for the record, please. And, and that's exactly why we would, uh, are recommending that we uh, Name the Lake Hefner Trails the Burke Cooper Trails because of he, uh, when when people weren't, uh, it wasn't easy and people 
weren't interested in the trails. He fought and he was one of those uh, people who never gave up and he made the difference. He was one of those uh, forefathers that uh, really has made the difference. And now I can't even imagine uh, the Lake Hefner without the trails. And I'm glad that Mr. Cooper, uh, he was significant in, in getting the monies from the uh, government to allow us to have those trails and he, uh, uh, I just really don't feel they'd be there without him and what a wonderful way not very often do we get an opportunity to honor someone like that in this way and that so I highly recommend that that we do uh, honor him in this way well I think it's like I say it's well deserved uh, his wife Terry's in the audience family uh, we certainly appreciate all that, that the uh, bird and the Cooper family has done uh, for Oklahoma City it's hard not to go somewhere that you don't get some involvement with, uh, with that so well deserved do I have a motion on this, please? We have a motion and a second. Cast your vote, and it passes unanimously. Congratulations. Terry, would you like to say something? I would like to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me. I would like to say thank you to all of you for this wonderful honor. I know Bert would have been well, he would have tried to be modest, but he wouldn't have succeeded very much. But he would have, he would have really been pleased. Um, he did fight hard for the trails uh, at a time when it wasn't necessarily a, a well-accepted idea. And I'm thrilled that, that you are honoring him this way. And it was almost a year ago when I was last here, and you honored his memory with a resolution of condolence. And that meant so much to his entire family. And so I thank you so much for all the things that you have done and said uh, in, in honor of Bert. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, we're at item seven, concurrence docket. Motion and second. Any comments or questions on the concurrence docket? Cast your vote, and it passes unanimously. We're on to item eight, item requiring separate votes. Item 8A1 is the ABC 776 at 5900 Mosteller Drive, uh, ABC 2, overlaying the PUD 1232 in Ward 2. Ed stepped out. Your Honor, oh, okay. it's been a restaurant at that location for years and years. It's closed right now, but it goes back to when that building was first built. And so I see no reason to deny this application. I would move to approve the application. Okay. Great. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Thank you. Kevin, is that all you wanted? Yeah, that's all I wanted. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Well, uh, uh, congratulations and good luck on your Thanks. enterprise up Thanks. there. It's Look forward to great, seeing it. It's a great that. location. I think it'll be a neat new restaurant for us. Okay. Uh, Kevin, will it rotate? Uh, well, we're, it's, we've redesigned the space, and um, it, it rotates still, but we probably won't rotate very often. That's good, because I did the first time I did it, I went to the restroom and couldn't find my table afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a great view, whether it's rotating or not. It's really, a, really a great view. Yeah. You're right about that. Thanks. Congratulations. Uh, it passes unanimously. 8A2 is an ABC 777, ABC 3, uh, in 228 Northeast 2nd in the uh, downtown business district, Ward 7. Skip's gone. Do we have anybody signed up on this? Okay. I move. We have a motion and a second. Cast your vote, and it passes unanimously. 8A3 is PC 10331 at 10501 Northwest 23rd. Um, going from double A to R1, this is in Ward 1, and, uh, and I don't have a problem with this. Anybody signed up? Okay. If I could get a motion on that, please. Move approval. I have a motion and a second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. 8A4 is PC10334 at 3400 North Lincoln, uh, going from R1 to O2 General Office District in Ward 7. Nobody signed up on this one. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. 
8A5, it's uh, SPUD 697 at 2501 South I-35 Service Road, going from R1 to AE2, oh, and AE2 in airport to a SPUD in Ward 7. Uh, move, move approval. Your Honor, have they agreed to all the uh, CEs? Yes, they have. Okay, thanks. It looked like there were no protests past the Planning Commission. Okay. Uh, unanimously, so I, I'd move approval. Get a second. Okay. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Item 8B is an ordinance on final hearing, uh, SP 452, a special permit to operate a participant recreation and entertainment. Uh, that well, that's been deferred. I'm sorry. Uh, deferred to March 26. 8C is a public hearing. Uh, on an ordinance for vehicles for hire. This is for the uh, nonprofit organizations. This is the second public hearing, and uh, uh, it will be on final next week, I guess. Anybody want to speak on this? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Item 8D is an ordinance to be introduced and set for final hearing on March 19th. Uh, this is issuance of GO bonds for $90 million. This is this year's series of the GO bonds. And I think we have a, we have a presentation on this. Uh, Craig's just going to talk to us a little bit about the timing of it and talk to us a little bit about our ratings on this issue. Yes, we had our, um, I mean, it's a $90 million sale. The actual sale will occur next week. Uh, but we did receive our ratings from Moody's and Standard & Poor's, and they both confirmed our AAA rating, uh, which is the highest rating that you can have on municipal bonds. And so it's a very strong rating for us and reflects very positively on the leadership that we have within the city, with, both with elected officials and with management. Um, and it's always as consist consistently with both of them a comment of a conservative financial management is one of the factors, ha maintaining high levels of reserves, the strong economy. and so. Uh, they're very positive on Oklahoma City, and so it's a very positive rating for us. It'll be $90 million in bonds. It'll be sold next week. We're expecting a true interest cost on the bids to come in under 3%, um, which is incredible. It's fantastic. So, uh, you know, the water bonds came in right at about 3%, um, and uh, they were very strong as well. And so uh, we're hoping to see a really good sale next week. Craig, that's incredibly exciting and to be able to maintain that AAA status for the number of years we have speaks so highly of the work that the city staff does. And very grateful yes. for it. Will the timing under this ordinance be appropriate? We don't have final approval until March 19th. Will that stand in the way of your efforts? The, 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 it will be final. It will be approved. The ordinance will be approved at the same time as the sale. Okay. So that will all be together. Any other questions? We have a motion. I need a motion. I'm so. Cast your vote. And it passes unanimously. 8E is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structure. Do we have anybody here to speak on dilapidated structure? I need a motion. I have a motion and a second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. 8F is a public hearing on unsecured structures. Do we have anybody here to speak on any items under unsecured structures? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Okay. 8G is a uh, right-of-way permit for Beck's Automotive to hold the Western Avenue block party March 24th. Uh, down Western Avenue from 41st to 42nd uh, in Ward 2. Yeah. I have a motion and a second. Okay. Cast your vote. Passes unanimously. We've already t dealt with 8H. Uh, 8I is a resolution approving the preliminary report for the phase one of the project sidewalk, uh, sidewalk projects for MAPS 3. Mr. Vice Mayor, Carl, Carl Baldeschweiler is here from uh, Smith Roberts Baldeschweiler to uh, go over this with us. Welcome. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, Carl Baldeschweiler. I'm with Smith Roberts Baldeschweiler. Yeah. Um, this is our uh, uh, preliminary report for Project One of the MAPS Three 
uh, phase one sidewalk improvements. Uh, I have the. This is the, uh, based on our preliminary report that we brought before you before uh, earlier, this is the uh, limits of the phase one, uh, which is approximately, we feel a minimum of 14 and a half miles, 17 alignments based on the bids that we might receive. We took, uh, did our estimates, and we had conservative estimates, and then hopefully that we'll get more of these alignments based on the bids that come in. We anticipate letting this phase one in three separate projects. Uh, for various reasons, one is to group the projects geographically, hopefully to get a better bid. Uh, second is to have concurrent projects going for com faster completion. And then third project would be if we have uh, favorable bids come in, we can extend the number of alignments in phase one. Uh, phase one uh, is uh, seven alignments uh, grouped in the north side of town. Uh, approximately six miles. Um, these are, again, geographically located up there. We hope we can get better bids uh, by doing that, not having a contractor work all over town. The, some of the uh, criteria that we're satisfying with these alignments, um, connectability, you can see there's existing sidewalks uh, on this northwestern alignment. We were making connections in the gaps of uh, some existing alignments. Uh, on North MacArthur, you can see that we have a desire path that's actually working as a drainage flume there along those uh, power poles. That was one of the other criteria. And then on this one, uh, you can see that we have some uh, sloped embankments that will have to have a high curb on the back side. That does affect the, uh, the price of the sidewalks, but again, most of the alignments uh, do not have these, uh, these types of issues. Um, phase one budget was approximately 17 alignments, 14 and a half miles of sidewalk uh, out of the $3.6 million. Phase one, project one, is approximately 5.9 miles uh, with an estimated construction cost of $1.437 million. Again, this is uh, based on average unit prices that we received in past projects. Again, hopefully we'll see better unit prices, lower bids so we can extend the number of alignments in project in phase one, and it would be in the third project. Project schedule, uh, notice to receive was in October, preliminary report was in February. Uh, we anticipate having 95% uh, plans by the end of this week and final plans by the end of the month. Hopefully receive bids in April and construction complete for project one in October. We anticipate about a two month gap between projects one, two, and three. And again, project three would include a, additional alignments if our bids come in favorable. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, I've got Carl on the uh, initial evaluation by the subcommittee. Yes. They identified several miles of the areas that needed to be, could, <coughs> excuse me, could uh, support sidewalk construction, and we're not going to have enough money to do all those. Do we have an estimate of how many dollars it would take to complete all of the sidewalks that you identified? Well, in, in the master plan? Yes. Well, the master plan we evaluated like 290 miles, and then we came back with, within the budget of uh, the MAPS 3, the 6.8 million, of approximately a minimum of 27 miles based on average unit prices that could be extended to as much as 38 miles. But there's been some discussion in the council here that we would step up and provide some additional funding on this project to complete more of the sidewalks. Are we still going forward with that? Yes, it's my anticipation that after these come in and we know a little bit more where the prices come in that we'll bring a resolution. We talked about using some fund balance to do some additional sidewalks and we'd bring that forth after we have a, a better price on where we're at after some of the Because the, the, the subcommittee did a lot of work and Carl guided them through this, identifying sidewalks that needed, definitely were needed. And I think it would be in, incumbent on us to look at those to make sure that if there was any money available, we could go ahead and fund those. Yeah, that's our intent to do so, sir. Any other questions? 
Thanks, Carl. We appreciate it. Just one question. What, what coordination, which of these in phase one have transit routes on them? Uh, in project one or just phase one? Well, project one, phase one. Um, well, I, I can't say that offhand without my, I've looked at so many miles I have trouble. I, we we can get that information, get back to you. That yes. was clearly a criteria that was used in the evaluation. We have, we we, have we an exhibit. Now, I remember it being a criteria. Now that, now that it's been selected, what, what kind of coordination is there done with COPTA or? Well, you mean going forward with construction? You know, with the actual construction. Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration of where we might want to put a footprint if we wanted to put a shelter later or where bus stops might be? Or are we waiting for the Nelson Nygaard study or what? Or this, this first phase going out, I mean, they will have be aware of where it's going out, but we're pushing this first phase as fast as we can to get construction completed and started on this one. But, but the fact is that, that. that sidewalks are going to be ADA accessible. And so the addition of a, of a bus facility, a, a shelter, uh, do it at some point in the future, will be possible. Will be possible because the, the access is already into it. Okay. So it should make it, it should make it fairly easy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? We have a motion. We need a motion. A motion and a second. Cast your vote. Passes unanimously. Eight J. I understand we do not need executive session. That's correct. Your Honor, before we strike it, can I ask a question? Did the city do anything wrong out here? Which one? Uh, okay. J. J. Yes. Uh, the city was negligent in having a pressurized water main so close to the home and had constructive notice of the problems with the water mains in the neighborhood and also failed to shut down the main within a reasonable time after the break was reported. Those, those, those are negligent beyond our normal responsibilities. Uh, I mean, why are we considered that negligent? It was, was it intentional or, you know, was it actually we would have a wrong? Duty. We have a duty to, if we have notice of a problem or if there is actually a main break, we have a duty to get out there within a reasonable period of time and get it shut down. I think there's a couple of factors in play on this one, Mr. Ryan. One is the fact that there had been some history of some breaks on the, on the, on the water line. And I think it's a gray area whether we had a, and I think that's why we're settling on it because it isn't clear whether or not we had enough notice on it that that line should be replaced. And then the other is that we had some problems getting the line isolated after the break occurred. Well, again, whether that, that, that's, a, uh, that's why it's a settlement because it, it was whether, a whether, fairly substantial settlement. And that's the reason I wanted to make sure that we were on firm ground. Thank you. Yes, and there, there was, they would be able to get to a jury on that. So there would be a jury trial if you actually litigated it. I need to amend my motion to adopt the uh, resolution. Okay. Do we have a motion? Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. 8K, I understand we do not need executive session. That's correct. Okay. Yes. We have a motion and a second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. 8L, we do not need executive sessions. Do we need to strike this item? Oh, we can. I, I just may make a comment that, if I, if I might. Um, the parties involved have been very involved in, in getting uh, uh, applications or, or uh, amic amicus briefs on the Supreme Court case of Tarrant County. And so we're taking a little bit of a break right now while everyone is working to prepare those, those amicus briefs. And we probably won't get into some serious negotiations until uh, a, a couple, three weeks from now, and probably sometime in, in early April. So it's, it's, a, it's a, not a major setback, but, but everybody, not the city so much as, as the state and, and, and the uh, and the tribes are, are very much focused on, on, on the uh, Tarrant County case before the Supreme Court. Okay. Cast your vote. And the item is stricken. 8M is claims recommended for denial. We have two items left on that. Anybody here wanting to speak on the claims recommended for denial? Yeah, let me just cast your vote. And it passes unanimously. Uh, I think we have an extra item that I'd like to take up now. Um,
going to executive session on the pending litigation of the IFF versus the city. And we do need executive session. Cast your vote. And it passes unanimously. Item nine is claims recommended for approval. Anybody here to speak on approval? Okay. Motion in a second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Item 10 is items from council. Item A is a resolution approving travel expenses for uh, Councilman Greenwell to attend the Harvard Kennedy School for Senior Executives in July. John, I have a question. How much is that estimated cost? That includes transportation, lodging, and well, meals. I'm sorry. It includes the school, the lodging, and all that, but it does not include the airfare. So roughly twelve thousand dollars. Yes. Uh huh. Have we have you sent anybody to the school before, David? I don't believe so. Have we, no, have we got any any testimonials about how effective it might be? Um, actually, we have had some staff attend that in, in, in the past, and, and, and we've had a very high level. Staff, but not, nobody no. on the city council has. No, sir. Okay, thank you, Brian. We have a motion. Oh, that second, okay. Cast your vote. It passes <coughs> unanimously. Items from council. Ed, you want to get us started? Yeah, just a big loss for Ward 2 on Sunday when John Belt um, died. Um, he has been called a pioneer, and I think that's a, an accurate term. What he, he, he literally was decades ahead of things that now seem kind of commonplace in our, in our vernacular, like placemaking and um, urban infill and all those things. He was literally decades ahead um, in what he did in, in Paseo, converting what was the Spanish village into um, the Paseo uh, in a, just a very slow, methodical uh, manner, starting in 1976. He, um, Got us that 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 neighborhood, which is uh, uh, probably much, it, in 2010, the American Planning Association um, named it the top 10 greatest neighborhoods in America, and that's the first one in Oklahoma that ever got that that award. Um, it was the named by Forbes magazine as America's top to revitalized neighborhood, and the BBC listed the Paseo as one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in the United States, and that's 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 really John Belt uh, more than anyone. Um, I'm really grateful that we have, he was at the Mayor's Development Roundtable last, in 2012, and that's on YouTube, if any, I don't know if there's any way we could put, there's a five minute segment that's really special now that he's, because he, he shows slides of what it was like before and after and all the work that was done and how they transformed that and it's, um, it's, there's, it's split into six segments, it's on segment five out of six on YouTube. It's right after Anthony McDermott speaks for about five minutes, and it's a really special um, presentation by him and his wife, and it just shows what what they did in Paseo. I don't know if we could put that up in ch on Channel 20 in some way. Um, he was... We'd be uh, happy to look at that, Councilman, and see what we can do. All, all it's, it's really, really nice, I mean, in, in retrospect now, um, and I'm glad that he, that he did that and that we have that. Um, Memorial. Um, he was just very calm. Um, unfortunately, the last time I saw him was dealing with some of these Chesapeake things on 50th and Western. And as everybody um, with the neighborhood could get excited, he was just always very calm and very soothing. And when he spoke, everybody calmed down and listened to him. And he was just very, very distinguished. A, a calmness that that comes with with knowing how much you've accomplished and that that. Um, that just calmed the rest of the group down. And I really appreciated knowing him. I really, really am grateful for what he's done and the gift that he's given to the city that we can enjoy for many generations. Thanks. Okay, David, anything? Meg? Just a couple of things. I also would like to express my condolences to Joy Reed Belt and the family. John was a terrific mentor of mine uh, as we began our work on Broadway and Automobile Alley and amazingly supportive and um, you know I there was an article great article in the paper today that Steve Blackmire wrote and uh, it referenced uh, the fact that uh, John actually sold a building to Rand Elliott years and years ago and I, I remember reading that article and 
um, you know, it's, it's so carefully expressed that this was the first time he'd ever sold a piece of property. <laughs> and luckily, as Steve pointed out, he did sell it to Rand, and we have that wonderful hydrant meat company building as well. Um, but the Paseo is a really special place. And um, I, I just, I guess I w would like to mention, I think the services are at 3 o'clock on Thursday at All Souls Church. Oh, he was a terrific guy. I also w I would like to thank uh, Pastor Mark Youngblood at Crossbridge Church for inviting me to attend uh, services on Sunday. Uh, the church was celebrating its 126th anniversary um, down at Southwest uh, 12th and Walker. Amazing, you know, not a large congregation, but a very blended congregation, old and young, African American and white, everybody coming together. Um, Willow was there uh, to celebrate with us and sang a hymn. She was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it's just one of those experiences that reminds you that you always receive more than you give when you're working with people that are there to uplift their neighborhoods. And, uh, it was a terrific experience. So I hope to get a chance to go back. Pat? Pat? City Manager Report. I, th I think Chief Bryan's here to talk to us a little bit about wildfires. Hopefully he'll join us uh, in, in a minute. And then we just have claims and payroll on our quarterly fund transfer reports. Speaking of wildfires, uh, the County Commissioner Maughan has a program to remove uh, cedar trees. And I think that would go a long way towards reducing some of the hazards we have for fires because when they're dry, they act like a bomb almost. From the fire. They explode and spread flames all over, embers all over. And so I think that's an excellent program and we ought to look at, at what he's doing and uh, perhaps uh, duplicate it on some of our city-owned facilities. And as you know, we are uh, us using that program on the south side of Lake Hefner to work on, uh, on some of those areas. He's uh, been very gracious to work with us on our issues on our property. Yeah, the other thing I was so surprised about, those red cedars, is they take up to 40 water? gallons of yeah. water a day. I mean, that's just unbelievable when we're experiencing this drought. So, well, and, they, and they convert that water to, a, to an oil in the tree that just explodes on you. So it's, uh, it's hard to stay ahead of them. So, Chief Bryant, welcome. Morning. Got some words of wisdom for wildland fires? Well, hopefully so, uh, Chief. We, uh, at, uh, <clears throat> Councilman Kelly, uh, I think, recommended that uh, we do a, a report on wildland fire prevention because of the upcoming uh, wildland. I mean, really, we're not, we haven't been immune to it at really any time. There's usually during different parts of the year when, when that spikes up a little bit. But with the drought conditions that you heard about here recently and the in the recent report that you had, uh, you know, that's been a constant uh, issue for us to address. And so uh, we put this report together and basically uh, what we've been trying to do in the last uh, year and a half or so is uh, just increase awareness, uh, not only to prevent fires for all people being very careful with their outdoor burning and the use of equipment and things of that nature that we see as the cause of some of these fires from time to time, but also comprehensively uh, with all the resources that are out there right now for wildland fire prevention, uh, pool those together into a program that we've uh, put together and presented <clears throat> in four different wards of the city in kind of the outlying areas over the past several months. And we, we, we continue to, to uh, want to encourage people to uh, uh, take advantage of that program if they will. But again, what we tried to do again is just increase awareness. That's a lot of it. Uh, that we see. People just sometimes, I don't think, pay attention to the conditions out there when we have really hot weather, low humidity, and, and, and dry conditions. And, you know, they want to do things outside with cooking and other types of burning, cleaning off their property and things of that nature. And that's where a lot of times that we run into trouble with these <clears throat> wildland fires. And of course, as we've seen in the past, uh, when those conditions are right, uh, they, they can affect a large area of the city and threaten homes and people's property. So we've done a series of things over the past several months uh, to, again, increase awareness, uh, try and educate our citizens a little bit better about what they can do to prevent these, and that's contained in this report. And I'll just hit a few of the points. But a lot of the things we've tried to do, again, uh, have been public uh, information type things. We've uh, done PSAs over some of the radio stations here locally. Again, just trying to increase people awareness to be very careful about what they do around their property. Uh, we're starting to issue gate tags when our firefighters that work out in those areas 
are out and about doing their work and they identify something that's a potential hazard like very high grass and weeds along a fence line, those types of things, put a little gate tag on the person's property to remind them that uh, that's something that they might want to address and, and help us out with and, and clean up. Uh, as I said earlier, we uh, conducted a series of town hall type meetings, uh, kind of in the four corners of the city. Uh, you know, those were, um, you know, uh, attended uh, well in some places, maybe not so well in others. I think, depending on how recently that area of town experienced a large fire, kind of uh, drove that whole issue as far as how many people. But we, we were there and we continue to have that program available if any neighborhood associations, uh, homeowners groups, so forth, want that information, we'd be glad to come out and, and provide that in that format. Um, We've tried to, uh, as part of our program, pool all the resources that are currently out there. So using some of the things that, uh, and the programs that are available through the State Department of Forestry, uh, the National Weather Service, American Red Cross, and other resources that pool those together and make sure that our citizens are aware of those programs that are available to them to assist them in this way. And then again, just tried to drive home the message and it's very simple. Um, when we've had these fires in the past, you know, our firefighters work very hard. They're very taxing. Our resources are, are really drained during those times, which has an impact to the, the city as a whole, that our resources are tied up. And so therefore, uh, the city itself is a little bit less protected because we're so stretched so thin at those times. But what we, uh, and as hard a work as our firefighters doing a great job as they do at protecting property during those times, we've also seen that the people that maintain their property have a lot higher probability of their property not being affected uh, during those times. So very just simple things that everybody can do as far as maintaining their property, keeping their grass cut low, keeping their trees trimmed up, uh, bushes, uh, cedar trees, as you mentioned, away from their property, uh, their, their home and so forth, and keep their lawns watered and things of that nature that where they stack their firewood. Uh, we've seen that that has a huge impact when we do have these fires that uh, people have, uh, that have done the work and maintained their property have a lot higher probability of their property not being damaged. So we would just encourage everybody again to be aware, to be very careful about what they do with their outdoor burning, uh, make sure that uh, if they're trying to uh, burn off debris and so forth that they obtain the permit because when they do that in the right way and do it on the days that we designate as burn days, uh, we usually don't have any problems from that. Um, be aware if uh, you know they see something that potentially could start you know one of their neighbors doing something they need to notify us as far as illegal burning things of that nature and you know sadly to say some of these fires are started intentionally just for the you know malicious purpose that some people might have of starting a fire just to see you know what kind of excitement they can generate so Make sure they're vigilant, and if they see something suspicious, they need to report that to us, and, and we'll certainly take a look at it. Um, but if anybody would like a specific program where we come out to your neighborhood or your community area or whatever, uh, they need to contact our public education office at 297-3318. We'd be glad to come out and speak to them. I'm glad to come out to any uh, specific homeowner's place and take a look at their property and give them some advice on what they might do to help better protect their property. So. Again, we want people to be vigilant. We want people to be careful and be aware of what they're doing and careful uh, so we can avoid these things if at all possible. One, uh, one comment uh, <clears throat> doesn't, have, it's not, doesn't have much to do with what the Oklahoma City can do on private property, but if weather conditions are right, uh, there's gonna be a controlled burn on the south side of Draper this week. Yes, sir. Uh, so. That's not something you can do. We can, we've, looked, we've talked a little bit about doing it outside of city-owned property, but there are all kinds of liability questions. But uh, uh, it, this is going to be a much larger one than, than the one we tried first. And hopefully, it's going to be a little hotter than the one we tried first. But uh, if this works, I mean, this is part of an ongoing program, at least on the Draper uh, uh, Elm Creek Reservation, to try to prevent them from at least starting continuing through that area. That's a big chunk of southeast of Kansas City. We hope yeah. to do that tomorrow or the next day, I guess. Probably. And uh, yeah, as we go through that program every year and it continues to expand, I think that's something that we'd be interested in maybe looking at other areas and like say, you know, 
clearing out a lot of that lower, uh, very dry ground fields that really kind of carry those fires and, 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 and you know, uh, contribute to the rapid spread of them. I, I will remind everybody that you, you can burn inside the city limits of Oklahoma City, but with a permit. And, Correct. And we do that so that we can. We issue those permits, and again, there's, there are days, been, depending on the weather conditions, wind and so forth, that uh, we designate as burn days. So uh, it's not just once you obtain a permit, you're free to go. You need to check with us and make sure that it's a designated burn day. Any other questions for the chief? Thanks, Chief Ryan. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other city manager report? No, sir. We're on to item uh, citizens to be heard. Joe Sarge Nelson. Name and address for the record, please, Joe. Well, my name is Joe Nelson, and I've been here before and uh, under different circumstances. I'm here today for a different reason now that I got my medical back and I'm in good health. Uh, I'd like to enlighten the city council on one thing. For four years, I spent a quarter of a million dollars investigating City Hall. I'm not going to lie about it. I got sick and uh, kind of got taken down and got off to a bad start last year with the documents I presented to you. They weren't games then, they're not games now. Uh, I left a document back there for the mayor, Mr. Couch, and Mr. Jordan. Within 10 days, I'd like a meeting with all three of you. No joke, no plays, no nothing. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to talk to you three people. Uh, I've already spent a little over 175000 in commercials. Last November the 18th, when I officially was talking properly in the background about running for mayor, because I didn't like the way this job was being done, they tried to burn me out, burnt my office down. The man was caught, sent three years in penitentiary. The only thing that made me stick it out in my mind real good is the man is, I do believe his last name was the same gentleman that uh, just recently passed away that is in the, some kind of business where printing and so forth and commercial is that the mayor works for or did. And that brought it to my attention. Fortunately, my documents were not destroyed. Uh, the police recovered them nicely they got uh, photographs, emails, all kinds of things. But my thing is, what I'm trying to say is, August the 19th, it came a little more direct when one of the Ogle boys asked one of the former mayors, why is everybody down here buying up personal property down in the city? We're down in here, what about the rest of Oklahoma City? There's nothing being done. We don't have police officers enough. We got between one and 2,000 police officers cover 606,000, uh, 606 square miles. That ain't even enough to cover 500 people. If a police officer was called for right here, right now, he'd be out doing his job somewhere else. You all would be in trouble. We got some fine officers out there. They protect you. Protect them. Give them some security. Give them some more backup. Put about 250 police officers. We can afford them. Quit spending so much money down here and let the police officers cover and protect what you're playing for. I know last time I spoke in here, I think I made a comical remark to him about stepping down. But I can tell you right now, I respect all you all privately outside this building. I really do, or you wouldn't be here. You need to work the better a little tighter, a little tighter. I'll show you how good my memory is for a 75-year-old man. I made, the comment was made that it did by him, when I think one of you gentlemen up there spoke, that, did I understand him correctly, that he's going to run for mayor? And then I was told I couldn't speak for a while, and Pete White said, well, that's for him. You remember that statement? Don't kid yourself, my memory is like a rock, and uh, I've been on both sides of the fence, but I'm not going to play jokes anymore. I'm deadly serious. From here on out, I'm going to play by the book, but I'm going to get some things done, and you're only going to work with me because I'll be at the biggest pain you have ever seen. I, like I said, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been a former investigator, both federal and state. I've been in a lot of places, and I'm a retired uh, from the military, and there ain't no too many people scare me that much. 
I'm walking on one leg and I can stand on two. But I would appreciate the courtesy if I treat you like the courtesy and respect, give it back to me. That's all I ask. But I would like to talk to you formally. I'd like to talk to the mayor and I'd like Mr. Jordan to be present. Because what I've got to show you, you're going to want to see. And that is no joke. And I'll be here with, with, if I can hear from you all within 10 days, I'd greatly appreciate it. Mr. Pete, nice to see you again. Mr. Shadid, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Mrs. Kersey, I don't know what she thinks about me right now. She probably like throw me out the window, but that's okay. Mr. Ryan, I hate to hear that, but skip. Mr. Greenwell, we've got a good body here, good working people. All we got to do is just pull together a little tighter. And you all know we're spending a lot of money we don't need to spend. And let me tell you the last thing I want to say, and it's a, not a joke. It started out that way. But I don't know who designed 40 out here, and I'm sure there was a lot of money went into this. I've been waiting for the first ice storm that never came. Going up and down these service roads from Penn and May and all this, I'm waiting for these guys to get up there and go start going down there. How are they going to stop? They're going to slide right out into Reno. You're going to have more suits than you have ever dreamed. I tested this theory about three weeks ago. I have a dent in my right front fender because I couldn't stop. But it was a joke, and I played it, and I had to pay for it. But the first time we get any ice out here, you're going to have to have ice trucks all over the place. And I'm sure you all thought this. You just never said anything about it. But that's, that's the way it is. And you all do work hard. And I comment you. You really do. And I'm looking right at you. I know you work hard. But I wish you'd really take me serious. Don't let my size fool you. I really want to talk to you people. Because uh, I'm a contract engineer. I have been one for 55 years. I've got some businesses in town. Two of the largest in the world right here in this city. And I just would like to have the courtesy for you people don't judge me by what I look and how I dress. I still work. And I'm going to work when I leave here. But I do appreciate y'all for what you do. I really do. But help me. The city needs it. You need it. Let's go for it. Okay? Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Any other citizens be heard? Okay, we have executive session. We have returned from the executive session. We are adjourned.